On the afternoon of April the 24th, 1916, the War Office in London received a telegram from Army Irish Command informing it of an armed uprising in Britain's second city, Dublin. With the Great War at its bloodiest, some 1,400 insurgents, recruited from the ranks of the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army, seized the General Post Office and other strategic locations in the city. Patrick Pierce read a proclamation declaring Ireland an independent republic and Britain's enemy in the trenches, Germany, a gallant ally. For five years, I sat at the cabinet table in 10 Downing Street, for two of those as Secretary of State for Defence. I'm back to explore how, a century ago, predecessors behind these walls, war-weary ministers, responded to a bloody rebellion in Dublin. Were the insurgents murderers and traitors, or martyrs and liberators? The Easter Rising is no less divisive today than it was a hundred years ago. These are the documents of the day. Cabinet papers, intelligence reports, military orders and diaries. British files undisturbed since they were written. Here is the story of the Easter Rising told by British politicians, soldiers, spies and bureaucrats. The architects of the Rising believed that England's weakness was Ireland's opportunity. That weakness was a war with Germany, a great war that by 1916 required a seemingly endless supply of young men to replace their dead comrades in the trenches. It was said that for every soldier there was a bullet with his name on it. British troops expected this bullet to be German. What they didn't expect was that the finger on the trigger was Irish. Was Dublin just another battle at a time of war where military justice was immediate and brutal? Or did the men who wrote these documents with their handling of the rising hasten the end of an empire? Did an unlikely band of rebels with playwrights and poets as leaders do more to advance the cause of Irish freedom in five days than nationalist politicians had done in the previous 50 years? Or did they damage the cause of an Ireland independent and united? Do the answers lie in the enemy files? The Easter Rising took the British government and military completely by surprise. But just a few hundred yards away from Downing Street, in the Admiralty Building, the dispatches from Dublin had been widely anticipated. Prime Minister Herbert Asquith had sanctioned the formation of a secret service in 1909 to identify the enemy and to find out what it was doing. So how could Britain's spies have missed this elaborate plot in Ireland. The truth is, they hadn't. Britain's Secret Service Bureau, which in 1916 became MI5, had obtained German code books. And in room 40 of the Admiralty, read enemy signals, including some passing between the German embassy in Washington and Berlin. In late March 1916, the Director of Naval Intelligence reported that the extreme Irish-American party contemplates an armed uprising timed for the 22nd of April at the latest. Other intelligence obtained in Dublin and Berlin confirmed the plot. Which leaves me wondering why, when the rising occurred one day late on Easter Monday, both the senior British politician in Ireland, Augustine Birrell, and the senior army commander, Major General Friend, were both in England. While other army officers had left Dublin for horse races, 
and the seat of the British government at Dublin Castle was virtually undefended. Pauline. Hello. Hello. How could it be then that the British government was so unprepared for the rebellion? I think we should remember, you know, this was uh, 1916, the most difficult part of the First World War, very difficult for the ministers of the day to take on board the fact that there was something really potentially quite nasty taking place, you know, in the heart of the, of the country and in the domestic context. So information coming in about what was going on in Ireland, very inconvenient and, if possible, to be ignored because there were bigger things at stake. I wonder if I could ask you to comment on specific uh, documents. Here is an extraordinary sheaf of telegrams. These are sent from the mm. Embassy of Germany in Washington to Berlin. I mean, this one particularly, the Irish leader, John Devoy, informs me that the rising is to begin in Ireland on Easter Sunday. Please send arms to arrive Limerick, west coast of Ireland, between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. To put it off longer is impossible. Let me know if help may be expected from Germany. It's signed Bernstorff, who I think is the German ambassador. That is authentic inf information, unconscious information. That's to say that uh, the enemy does not know that it's in our possession. Therefore, there is no reason to suppose that this is in any way false information or in any way put forward to act as a decoy. That's a sort of crown jewel of, of uh, intelligence when you get something like that. The intelligence breakthrough on Ireland came on the 10th of February 1916, when a message was intercepted and decrypted, giving the planned date for the rising as between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Here, in unpublished memoirs by Henry Oliver, Admiral of the Fleet, he says, we knew beforehand that the revolution in Ireland would start on Easter Monday, 1916, and made naval preparations in advance. The cabinet would not believe the First Lord. Mm. <laughs> what do you make of that? Well, I, actually, even, even in the context, I think, of, of, of the situation I've described, I find that quite surprising. Now, by modern standards, you know, not actually taking the director of naval intelligence seriously would be a pretty extraordinary thing to do. Uh, I think you come back then to the culture of and, and, the, and the context in which people are operating and the immaturity of the system, which leads to the ability actually just simply to ignore information which is you know, highly inconvenient. As the Rising entered its second day, the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, Lord Wimborne, was isolated in the Viceregal Lodge in the Phoenix Park in Dublin. Fearing for his own safety, Wimborne, an unelected figurehead, took a decision of historic significance by proclaiming martial law without consulting the Prime Minister. The following day, the Cabinet extended martial law throughout Ireland for an indefinite period, and the process of changing moderate nationalists into revolutionary republicans had started. Ireland was placed under military control. Field Marshal French ordered two brigades to Ireland without waiting for approval from the War Office. In April 1916, the Sherwood Foresters were in training near Watford, preparing for the war in France, although Due to a shortage of weapons, some of them had yet to fire a rifle. On Easter Monday, they were on leave, and they had to be gathered up from the cinemas and pubs for an extremely rapid departure by rail. But instead of heading for a channel port, they were carried north, and rumors began to sweep through the trains that they were about to fight not Germans, but their fellow countrymen. Irish rebels on British streets.
One of the officers on board ship captured the mood of that day. I make no bones about it, it was tragic. You must remember that all of the officers and men came from Nottingham and the Retford Newark Worksop district of the county. And they all knew each other and each other's parents and relations. They had not the slightest desire to shoot down the Irish or any other English-speaking people. The first ship to steam out of Liverpool, the Munster, was too small for the two battalions that it had embarked. And with speed trumping every other consideration, officers' kit and the battalion Lewis machine guns were left behind. And so London's first response to the uprising in Ireland was to send under-equipped officers commanding poorly trained soldiers with no heavy weapons to fight an enemy that had taken up entrenched sniper positions on the roads into Dublin. The reinforcements from England, so anxiously awaited by General Friend, landed here at Dunleary, which then was known as Kingstown, on the Tuesday night. In the morning, the four battalions of Sherwood Foresters marched through streets which, according to one of their officers, Captain Arthur Lee, were thick with people clapping and cheering northwest towards Dublin. Those troops have been demonized for a brutal suppression of the rising. Well, in the main, they were newly recruited lads from Nottinghamshire, and on the roads into the capital, they were slaughtered. The officers had been invited to breakfast by members of the Royal Yacht Club, where they awaited orders from brigade headquarters. they'd arrived in an island that was staunchly against the rising. Kevin, hello. Michael. Now, I believe it's your view that the Irish people were essentially misled about the events of 1916. Why so? Be because it wasn't necessary for Irish independence to be brought about by the use of violence. The interesting thing about the leaders is that not one of them had ever stood for any electoral office ever, apart from James Connolly, who stood for Dublin Corporation in the Woodkey Ward, and he came last. Otherwise, not one of those people who could have stood for Parliament or local government had chosen to have done so. They chose the violent route without ever trying the democratic one. One of the things that has struck me about the documents is the character and quality of the Sherwood foresters who arrive. I mean, it seems a lot of them were very inexperienced and very, very young, and also put in a traumatic situation where they were being shot at by their own countrymen, by fellow citizens of the United Kingdom at the time. Can you imagine the state of mind they must have been in? It's impossible to understand how uh, a soldier can cope with a situation where essentially the, the, they are fighting a civil war for which they have no preparation. Soldiers by 1916 had been taught to fight trench warfare, they were not taught how to fight house-to-house -house fighting, which is an entirely different skill. The insurgents would have had a very clear advantage. They knew the streets, they knew the windows, they knew the nature, the topography of Dublin. It's quite clear that the officers of the Sherwood Forest and other troops arriving, they were completely ignorant of the circumstances in which they were fighting. And if you have a man firing from behind a window, of which there were very few on the Western Front, he has a clear advantage over an incomer who has no knowledge of where he is. Wednesday, April the 26th, the third day of the Rising. On landing in Ireland, the British troops must have wondered who this enemy was. The Irish who greeted the soldiers cheered them on and plied them with tea and sandwiches. Who were these insurgents in the centre of Dublin? Whom did they represent? There seemed to be scant support for the new republic on the streets of Ireland. But as the troops got ever closer to the centre of the city, 
the reality of the rising became brutally apparent. They marched into a killing zone, and the Great War was about to arrive in the affluent surrounds of Georgian Dublin. The rebels could hear the troops coming before they came into sight. They were armed and ready. The first volley of shots peppered into the marching column and 10 men lay dead within seconds. The massacre was at its worst here at Mount Street Bridge, where the British dead and wounded lay knee deep as fire poured upon them from shooters in Clan William House. This was unnecessary carnage. These rebel strongholds could have been bypassed to be cleared up later. Indeed, the brigade commander, Colonel McConkie, questioned the order to clear each building as he advanced. But this was 1916, the year of the Battle of the Somme, when generals routinely ordered the boys to go over the top. Strewn along the canal banks, the bridge, and around the schoolhouse nearby, lay some 230 men, dead and wounded. Robert, what a pleasure. Hello, Michael. Um, the British tactics of advancing and destroying the enemy house by house with terrific casualties, what does that tell us about their mentality? Well, it tells you the generals have been in France where they've been doing the same thing for many months. I mean, it was a British tactic, it's storm forward, it doesn't matter how many people you lose. Interestingly, the 1916 rebels, as my dad would have called them, the 1916 rebels, they were also uh, killing an awful lot of innocent people, and they took precious little heed of their own lives. I've got here an extract from the brigade commander's diary. Uh, he's talking about a number of officers who are shot. Then he says, I returned to Bull's Bridge to the telephone and asked Irish command if the situation was sufficiently serious to demand the taking of the position at all costs. Absolutely extraordinary. Bleak, isn't it? Bleak. <laughs> that they would, that these were the tactics that were adopted. And obviously adopted knowing that Dublin was filled with civilians. In other words, there was no concern taken of a, a number of innocent people who were going to be killed in these battles. This was a British city. This had to be stamped out quickly. There was no letting this run on and on and starting to have negotiations. That was out of the question. What kind of military response do you expect other than an absolutely brutal one? I think that Britain had been in the war so long by this stage, and there'd been so many massacres of our own men, that they had come to a, a stage of thinking where casualties didn't matter. It only mattered when you ran out of men. It didn't matter how many you killed on the streets of Dublin or on the fields of the Somme, as long as you had more to come. But the one thing Britain could not tolerate was a war at home. The German fleet was to attack British cities on the east coast. We had zeppelins over London. Dublin was a step too far. This was a major British city up in arms. And I think they all went a bit mad. Britain's enemy in a terrible war was complicit in the rising. Germany supplied arms to the rebels. There was talk of a German invasion of Ireland now, all over Dublin, it was proclaimed that the Irish Republic and Germany were allies. 
Sooner or later, they discover a proclamation of an independent Ireland, which refers to the Germans and the Central Powers as gallant allies. Our gallant allies, I think. <laughs> that, I mean, that, that must have been yeah. a, a, a that huge was a, provocation. That was the death sentence. That was the death sentence. That's, that killed them straight away. I mean, why they'd sign their name to that? I mean, was it really necessary to put in gallant allies? I can't believe it was, but they put it in. Pierce did, anyway. There is a very odd parallel, and I don't wish to belabor it, between the kind of cult of blood and martyrdom, which we, we can read in the proclamation itself, it's so rhetorical, and another cult that exists today in the Middle East, which I ne don't even need to name, which also has a cult of blood sacrifice, other people's blood too. Were these Easter days of carnage necessary? Could Ireland have achieved what it's achieved after that without this terrible incident? No. The British would not have let Ireland go. The moment when Ireland as a nation started to turn came after the massive killings on the Western Front. Remember, Irish men were dying alongside the Brits and, and the, the telegrams were arriving all over Ireland in just the same way as they were arriving in Liverpool or London. After the rising, there was no natural cohesion in this land for Britain. The North, perhaps, but certainly not in the rest. Major General Friend's first report from Ireland after the Rising talked of civil war. Had the whole of Ireland risen in support of the newly proclaimed Republic? With the General Post Office in rebel hands, communications between Dublin and the outside world were severely disrupted, and commanders here could not know whether this uprising was Ireland-wide, affecting both South and North. But the Amien Street station had not been seized, and its telegraph office was intact, enabling this telegram to be sent via the Great Northern Railway Company, Ireland. Deliver following message from military headquarters Dublin to garrison commander Belfast. What is situation in Belfast? Can you or 15th Brigade spare troops for Dublin if required? The answer was that the North was quiet and that a large number could be spared and loaded onto the trains. As soon as the news reached Belfast, the UVF mobilized its forces. Unionist leader Sir Edward Carson offered 50,000 men for the maintenance of the king's authority. Craigavon House may be considered the spiritual home of Ulster Unionism. The Ulster Volunteer Force was founded here, and from the steps of the house, Unionism's leader, Sir Edward Carson, proclaimed Ulster's Solemn League and Covenant. Until the outbreak of the First World War in August 1914, Unionists had been preparing to take up arms against the British Crown to prevent home rule in a united Ireland. When news reached these parts of the Easter uprising in Dublin, organized as it was by an unelected minority, it met with predictable condemnation from unionists, but also with disapproval from a majority of nationalists. Avon, hello. Hello, Michael, how are you? Nice very, to see very you. Very good to see you. Shall we have a seat? Thank you very much. I've got a little diary here that was written by a soldier in the Ulster Regiment fighting on the Russian front in 1916. The Irishmen in the brigade, at hearing that there is a rebellion going on in Ireland, are very much disturbed. Several of them wanted to go home straight away. It must have been a great shock to Ulster. Well, absolutely. These are members of Carson's army who formed up outside this house, for example, to fight for Britain, for Ulster, for the Empire and suddenly they hear that there is a revolution occurring in Ireland. They wonder if their homes are safe, if their families are safe, and there's an impulse to seek firm intelligence from the war office. Some of them are even threatening to leave their posts. And then eventually, 
news is sent to the trenches that the rising has been crushed and Ulster is safe. And the diary then talks about the quality of the food. <laughs> Does the fact that there exists in Ulster a well-armed and loyalist Ulster volunteer force give a certain amount of leeway to the British to move troops south? I think the documents show that, you know. Remember, there's a lot of people in the UVF who were not fighting at the front. They were working in the shipyard. They were managing farms. Uh, and they're well armed with those German guns which had been run into Larne in 1914. We have plenty of evidence of flying columns, for example, motorized flying columns operating in rural Ulster during the week or so of the rising uh, in places like Tyrone and Armagh. And of course, this enables the RIC to concentrate on internal security, the regular police, if you like. And it allows, obviously, uh, British troops stationed in Belfast and Armagh and elsewhere to be sent to Dublin to crush the rebellion. Before World War I, Unionists had been prepared for civil war to prevent home rule within a united Ireland. The rebels blew home rule apart in just a few days. So there's a certain irony here, isn't there? Before the First World War, the Unionists are prepared to take up arms to fight against Home Rule, but it's not clear whether they'll defeat it. But with the Easter Rebellion, the idea of Home Rule in a united Ireland has been dealt a blow. Yes, I think historians would now agree that the Easter Rising really made partition more likely, though it had always been implicit in the debate. The only question was the acreage and the kind of uh, uh, sort of time limit of partition. Um, but certainly after the Rising, there's a clamant demand to do something to shore up Redmond, to shore up moderate, loyal nationalism, which, with Carson, has cooperated with Britain in the war. And even Carson is prepared to extend the hand of friendship to Irish nationalism. It might have worked. It might have produced a partitioned Ireland with a very soft line on the map because both parts of Ireland would still have been part of the UK subject to the overriding authority of London. But it's doomed because Redmond is fatally damaged as Sinn Féin rises from the ashes of the GPO. But Carson is also diminished. While still the popular hero of Ulster Unionism, he asked for sacrifices from Ulster Unionists, abandoning the outlying Unionists, places like Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal. He found himself diminished by all that politicking. He would remain a figurehead, but he never holds the same authority again within Ulster Unionism. A thousand troops were dispatched from Belfast to complete a cordon around the north side of Dublin. Field artillery from a garrison at Athlone arrived from the west. 16,000 troops arrived from England, and the patrol vessel Helga sailed up the Liffey with insurgent strongholds in her sights. The rebels were now surrounded, and the noose was tightening. British soldiers suppressed Republican positions with machine guns, spraying them with so many bullets that return fire was impossible. Then came the artillery barrage. And by the morning of Thursday, April the 27th, the fourth day of the Rising, the center of Dublin was ablaze. And the rebel defeat, inevitable. Having suffered such heavy casualties in house-to-house -house fighting, the British used artillery against the General Post Office and other major buildings held by the rebels. The noise of the battle was deafening. The destruction was widespread and fires raged across the centre of Dublin. As Britain struggled with Germany on the Western Front and appealed to the United States for its support, the blazing ruins of its second city were not the image that it wanted to offer to the world. As the General Post Office was pounded by artillery, the most vicious street fighting occurred in the mesh of tenements around North King Street, just north of the River Liffey. The British troops had tried to take this Republican enclave, 
only to see 45 of their own shot dead or wounded. General Loeb ordered a merciless advance along the street that became a key component in the bitter legacy of the Easter Rising, as the British troops were about to avenge their fallen comrades. The British troops sent to quell the Rising were ordered that every man found in a house from which shots had been fired was to be considered as a rebel, whether armed or not, and that no prisoners were to be taken. In May, a military court of inquiry met here at Richmond Barracks in Dublin to consider allegations that British soldiers had killed civilians in North King Street and prisoners in cold blood. A senior Home Office civil servant, Sir Edward Troop, advised ministers against publishing the evidence as it might be used for hostile propaganda. Why? Because he believed that the orders given to the troops were, as he put it, the root of the mischief. But what better for hostile propaganda than a cover-up? General Sir Edward Troop comments here that the root of the mischief was the military order to take no prisoners. This in itself may have been justifiable, but it should have been made clear that it did not mean that an unarmed rebel might be shot once he'd been taken prisoner. It was the root of the mischief, wasn't it? Short answer is, yes, it was the root of the mischief. I think Brigadier General Lowe, when he gave his written orders and then repeated them verbally, orally, to his commanding officers, was unclear in what he actually intended. The soldier likes clarity, and I think as the orders were passed down from the Brigadier General in charge of the operation right down to the private soldier on the ground, clarity was inserted, and the soldier on the ground understood that they were not to take any prisoners. And if you don't take any prisoners, people that you believe have done wrong, you shoot. I don't think actually Brigadier General Lowe intended that everyone should have been shot. I wonder what the order did mean, because in the end, after all, prisoners were taken. What he was really trying to say is, let's get on and let's get this done. We're not going to take any prisoners. He didn't mean, and I'd like to think he didn't mean, that we're going to kill everyone that we're, that we're dubious about. But that was how it was interpreted. On Friday, April the 28th, with the rising in its fifth day, inexperienced soldiers armed with rifles and vague orders started to shoot on sight. And over the next two days, civilian bodies piled up in the houses and cellars of North King Street. General Maxwell says here, parties of men under the great provocation of being shot at from front and rear, seeing their comrades fall from the fire of snipers, burst into suspected houses and killed such male members as were found. It's perfectly possible that some innocent citizens were shot in this manner but the blame for such casualties must be on the shoulders of those who engineered the rebellion in the city. How do you feel about that? I think that's a very senior person elegantly attributing blame in a convenient place. In the hurly-burly, the intensity of the situation, very difficult for them in an instant to say, that's a Sinn Féin rebel and that's an innocent person. When a bullet is fired, the echo and the ricochet means you really have no idea where it's coming from. It resonates entirely with my own early experiences in the early 70s and 80s in, in Belfast. Taking cover behind a red pillar box or around the corner of a red telephone box, it feels most odd. And you look up and see shops which you recognize in your own hometown, but there are people out there shooting at you. It's a very unnerving and unusual experience. And these young South Staffordshire soldiers would, would have found that too. We meet here in rather extraordinary circumstances because this is what remains of the Richmond barracks and somewhere in here was the court of inquiry. Do you imagine that it would have been an injustice for some of these ordinary soldiers to face further disciplinary action if actually they were following orders which told them to regard every man in a house from which fire was coming to be thought a rebel and that they were to take no prisoners? The correct answer has to be Every man, in every situation, is responsible for their own actions and they have to apply their own moral judgment. That's fine in principle.
but take, let's say, an 18-year-old South Staffordshire private soldier in the hurly-burly and the confusion that we're just talking about. It was probably easier for him to keep in his mind we're not taking any prisoners than to actually use and apply that quite sophisticated moral judgment. So you start to backtrack it and say, well, who does carry the responsibility? And it starts to edge up the chain of command. And on the face of it, it would seem that an unclear instruction issued by Brigadier General Lowe was, as several troops said, the root of the mischief. On Saturday the 29th of April 1916, six days after he'd read the proclamation outside the GPO, Pierce was told to surrender unconditionally and that all armaments were to be given up. In British eyes, he and all the rebels were traitors who had merely to throw themselves on British mercy. And mercy was in short supply, especially when the new military governor of Ireland came to town. General John Maxwell arrived in Dublin just in time to take the surrender. And in the great drama of the Easter Rising, the most divisive character of all took center stage. The general was determined to crush this insurgency with great speed and bring World War I justice to bear on the ringleaders. Traitors on the Western Front were shot dead. Why should traitors on the streets of Dublin be treated any differently? British ministers showed their resolve to suppress the rising by appointing a military governor. General Sir John Maxwell was chosen partly because he had no record with Ireland. He blamed the government for failing to deal with the rebellion effectively before it reached ahead. Not unreasonably, in my view. But that made him determined to resist interference by elected ministers as he crushed it. Because Maxwell knew what he needed to do, while Asquith merely reacted to events after they had happened, the history of Ireland bears the stamp of the general more than of the prime minister. Charles. Michael, hello. Good to see you. Um, Maxwell has been pretty much demonized for the executions in particular, but it seems to me that it is the politicians who through their neglect allow him to make the weather on the ground. Would you agree with that? Well, ultimately, that's true. Um, he's only an instrument of policy. Um, if you send a soldier in to do this job, you must expect him to bring military preoccupations. His job, as he understood it, was to act resolutely. He didn't have much connection with Ireland. That seems to have been actually rather a good reason for appointing him. But did he then lack an understanding of Ireland, do you think? I think most of the senior soldiers lacked a real understanding of Ireland. They tend to take a pretty simple view of Sinn Féin, and they just cannot believe that it is a movement that really has any moral authority. And so most soldiers are really looking for ways of destroying Sinn Féin from a very early point. Having suppressed the rising in a swift and brutal fashion, Maxwell moved on to swift and brutal justice. Once again, he was largely left to his own devices. The general decided who lived and who died. Once the rebellion has been crushed, we get to the matter of the courts martial and the death penalties and the executions. Uh, what do you think Maxwell's reasoning is at that time? I don't know if he had a fixed idea about how many people should be executed, but he wanted to have very rapid proceedings. As very often when soldiers are sent to do difficult jobs by governments, the governments often don't define their terms of action. I think in this case, the question really is, was there a point at which the British authorities could have stopped the execution process. Is there a number that would have been considered reasonable? And uh, I mean, the number that were executed would not be considered excessive in some situations. Uh, but in Britain, in, in, inside the United Kingdom, it, it's enough to 
provoke uh, a very hostile public reaction. Yeah. But when he faces these criticisms, on the one hand, he says, well, I might have executed many more people. I've been quite lenient. And on the other hand, he says that I have a thick skin. I can, I can weather this. I, mean, I think he just hoped that his analysis, that the mass of Irish people were loyal, and that they would accept and even possibly applaud the punishment of the leaders of this revolt. When he finds that he's wrong about that, I think he's increasingly upset. Whether that's because he realises that this is his big chance, if you like, and he may have blown it. He tries not to give that impression, but one feels that there's something of that about it. 16 men, including every signatory of the proclamation, were sentenced to death. Thomas Kent was shot at the military detention barracks in Cork, and Roger Casement was hanged in Pentonville Prison in London. But the vast majority of the executions were carried out at Kilmainham Jail during a 10-day period in May 1916. When it came to forming up the firing squads that marched along this track from the barracks towards Kilmainham Jail, the British soldiers were willing enough. They'd seen their comrades mown down by snipers just a few days before. Amongst the officers and NCOs, feelings were more complex. Second Lieutenant William Wiley, a barrister, was an unwilling prosecutor who believed that the courts martial should be held in public and that the accused should be assigned a defence lawyer. Out of a sense of justice, he conducted effectively both the prosecution and the defence. Lieutenant A. A. Dixon rehearsed the firing squads meticulously, and he was very pleased with the efficiency of the operation. The United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland was fighting an existential struggle against Germany, and the war was not going well. The Easter rebels had plotted with Berlin and killed 116 British officers and men. At a time when soldiers were being shot for desertion, it was perhaps a surprise that as few as 16 insurgents were executed in total. But what the Irish situation required was not a judicial or military response, but a political one. The fact that Patrick Pearce and others had courted martyrdom should have alerted the British government to the propaganda trap. Alas, the Prime Minister, Mr Asquith, never got a grip. After the first three had been executed, he's recorded as limply being surprised that the trial and sentence had been so rapid. General Maxwell was allowed to go on, piling up the martyrs, particularly here in the Stonebreaker's Yard. Sergeant Major Samuel Lomas wrote in his diary that Thomas McDonough was marched in blindfolded and the firing party placed 10 paces distant. Death was instantaneous. The second, P.H. Pierce, whistled as he came out of his cell. The third, J.H. Clark, an old man, was not quite so fortunate, requiring a bullet from the officer to complete the ghastly business. Just over an hour later, Lomas wrote, this business being over, I was able to return to bed for two hours and excuse duty until noon. General Maxwell ordered a large lime pit to be dug in the yard of the Arbor Hill prison, and the bodies were brought in ambulances 
along the banks of the Liffey. Each corpse was identified by a name tag and a sketch map marked its final resting place. The Prime Minister Asprith wanted to grant Mrs Pierce's request that the remains of her two sons, William and Patrick, be returned to her for interment in consecrated ground. But Maxwell vetoed, arguing that they would be turned by Irish sentimentality into the shrines of martyrs. Well, that was going to happen wherever they lay. But the general had seized the opportunity to make the British appear to the Irish as inhumane, shabby and sacrilegious. Prime Minister Asquith came to Dublin on the 12th of May 1916. His timing could hardly have been worse. He landed in Dunleary just hours after James Connolly and Sean McDiarmidder had been shot. Asquith ordered an immediate end to the executions. Declan. Very good to see you. How are you? I'm very well. I, uh, I must say that even as a Brit, I find Arbor Hill a pretty moving sort of place. And I wondered whether you'd ever seen these. These are British sketch maps made as the bodies were brought here. This one points to where the graves are. This one lists the exact positions of certain bodies. Had you ever seen those before? I've never seen these before, and I'm sure most Irish people haven't either. What's your reaction to them? Well, it's poignant and in more ways than one. Sad to think of the dead men, but also there seems to be a kind of military mind trying to control, create the illusion of control where perhaps most control is already lost. You have written of the rebellion as being a kind of street drama. You referred to the fact that some of the rebels wore costumes, carried sabres. Why do you think of it as a street drama? Why would they want it to be a street drama? They take over the post office, which is disastrous from a military strategic viewpoint, as Michael Collins warned them at the time, because it's exposed on all sides. But it's brilliant as street theatre. It cuts across the life of the capital city. It seizes the main building, and it paralyzes communications. It makes everyone attend. And at the end of the week, Pierce symbolically hands over a sword to the British officer. It's, it's almost a gesture from the age of opera, if you like. General Maxwell believed that he'd brought the curtain down on this production, and he was sure there would be no repeat performance. He thought the rising could be a blessing in disguise. We were talking about theatricality. And I was struck by this document, too. It is the rubric for the uh, executions. And uh, this has a certain theatricality as well. Uh, the rifles of the firing party will be loaded by other men, one rifle with a blank cartridge, 11 with ball. Uh, the men will not be told which one is blank. Mm. Once a prisoner has been shot, a medical officer will see that he is dead. The body will immediately be removed. A label will be placed on the breast. I mean, this is theatricality as well, isn't it? It's incredibly deliberated. It, it is a production, like The Rising itself, and maybe a counterproduction, not quite as effective, but interesting in its way. But I think it may also be rooted, as I say, in this fear that they're losing control. And, and also, maybe, um, I've read accounts, for instance, of the men who actually carried out the executions, and one of them reported back that they all died bravely, but McDonough died like a prince. There's a sense in which, which you often get with soldiers, that when they're asked to kill someone, they actually kind of admire some of the people they're asked to kill and don't really want to. And that's why I say the British official mind was conflicted. Maxwell and his firing squads had a dramatic effect on Irish public opinion. The executioner's bullets and the dark shadows of martial law over Ireland transformed the villains of Easter Monday into national heroes. In the years after the Rising, 
the Irish Parliamentary Party continued the political fight to secure home rule, but they were swept aside by Sinn Féin in the general election of 1918. The rising changed the nationalist consensus in favour of home rule into a widespread demand for an Irish Republic. The rebels had set Irish history on a different course, and within five years, the island would be split in two. The gun was about to replace the ballot box. Ireland had changed utterly. What I take from these eloquent documents gathered along my journey is that the disaster suffered by Britain in Ireland in 1916 was caused by the government's neglect. It failed to read Irish minds or to counter the build-up of military activity, first in the north and then in the south. And following the rising, it failed to control General Maxwell. Asquith learned about key decisions, like the declaration of martial law or the execution of rebel leaders after the event. And it strikes me as a former politician that the government, distracted by world war, failed to apply its political nous to Ireland. I'm convinced that the rebels made the modern history of this country. Without the rising, Ireland would not have won her independence, her freedom, when she did and as she did. But I fear that the ferocity of the rising and of its suppression by the British set the standard and that the violence that has plagued this island during the last century is also part of their bequest. And the rebel dream of an Ireland united north and south is no closer today than it was at Easter 1916. Continuing later tonight, the commemorative drama first broadcast on RTE 50 years ago, exploring the events of Easter week, Insurrection at 11.35. Stay tuned to the break to see what's coming up now on Clareburn Live. <laughs>